Guys, here we are back picking up with track freeze after our projector freeze or our projector crash, whatever happened there. But uh, so we left off with track freeze. If I want to preserve CPU, I can use this icon right next to this tick based icon, this little snowflake. And we can see if I hover over it, it says that the track's not frozen. So I'll click that snowflake icon and then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to freeze this track. Now we can do this on audio tracks, aux tracks and instrument tracks. We can use the freeze function and the editing is disabled. So we can see here that I can't edit on this track. If I make an edit selection and try to delete, I can't do anything on that track. But <clears throat> if I want to get in here and adjust these plugin parameters, I can just click that icon again and then I get real time control over everything. So I have three places where I can use track freeze. I can use the track menu, I can click on the freeze icon, or I can right click the nameplate and select freeze. Same locations for the most part as commit. Um, track freeze and uh, right click. So if you choose track freeze and right click, the difference being that we don't have a commit icon, but we do have a freeze icon in the track. So you can see that when I do freeze the track, the plugin goes inactive. And then as I was talking about, you lose the ability to make edit. Well, you can make an edit selection, but you just can't delete because you get that superimposed uh, waveform over the MIDI. So the plugins are, are inactive and I can't do any editing on the track. So what is rendered? Now, remember, this is a temporary render because we can take the freeze off, we can release the freeze status. So the plugins, plugins are frozen. Clip gain. Now let's look at this audio track real quick here. So let's click the freeze icon on the audio track. Actually here, let me cancel for a second. <clears throat> I'm gonna unfreeze. So here's my clip gain here. Remember if I go to view uh, clip, Clip gain line, clip gain info. Clip gain line is the line itself. Info is the little fader down in the clip here. But if I have the trim tool, I can adjust this clip gain. Or if I just grab the little fader here, I can adjust the clip gain. But as soon as I freeze the track, see I lose those controls. I can't adjust clip gain. I don't have the little info to adjust the fader. Uh, and then elastic audio as well. So let's go unfreeze. Let's put Elastic Audio on here. Let's freeze. So you see I lose the ability to control the Elastic Audio, but it's in there. If I have Elastic Audio processing happening, it's in there. Just can't manipulate it as well as I can't manipulate the uh, clip gain. But I still have track controls that are preserved that don't get rendered. So let's take this instrument track here. So I can still adjust volume. I can still adjust pan. If I have a send active, now I'm just gonna put this on a bus. This, this is not creating the send return loop that we need. This is just assigning the send to a bus. So this routing would be incomplete, but I'm just showing you the function of the send is still active even though the track is frozen. So I still have full control over there. I can still mute, I can still make pre and post fader, post -fader sends which we'll talk about in the mixing lecture. But I still, I still have a lot of control over my track. I just don't have a lot of editing control or plugin manipulation control. Now, plugins that are not frozen when using freeze to insert maintain their plugin automation. So for example, let's take off here. If I was to have another plugin on here, let's say EQ. And then uh, if, if I use freeze to insert, okay, which is this option right here. So I switch to the slide. So I'm gonna take my Dune 3 and I'm gonna right click on Dune 3 and I'm gonna say commit up to this insert. So I'm committing Dune, I'm sorry, no, I'm, I'm gonna freeze up to this insert. So I'm gonna right click and freeze up to this insert. 
And what you're going to see is that Dune is going to go inactive, and I'm going to be using Dune in the frozen state. But then the plugins that are after Dune are still active, and I can still fully control these plugins. And if I want to add any of the plugin automation in here, I can do that, and it will still be active. We've talked about this, but we can just review it here so the clips can't be edited when we use Track Freeze. Elastic Audio cannot be enabled on tracks utilizing Track Freeze. So if I go back to my audio track here, and I take off the Elastic Audio, and then I freeze the track. Track's frozen. Can't, I'm clicking where I would load the Elastic Audio plugin, and I can't, can't, uh, I can't do that. So just something to be mindful of. Clip gain can't be manipulated on frozen tracks. We talked about that. Um, and then the conductor track cannot be disabled when frozen tracks are in the session. So remember, your conductor track is over here. I'm holding Command, by the way, to drag this this um, mid the MIDI controls somewhere else in the edit toolbar I can move that I can hold command and I can move this into a different spot what I want you to be able to see is the conductor track and so I have a track frozen in the session here and then right now when I click on the conductor it gives me the indication that I can't disable the conductor track uh, because I have tracks frozen in the session so just something to be mindful of Global freeze, very straightforward. Um, if I, let's unfreeze this track here. All right. So I can option click one of the freeze icons, right? If I'm holding option on my keyboard and I click a freeze icon, then I can freeze all the tracks in the session. Also, at the top of the screen here, you don't see it right now because there's no tracks frozen in the session, but you can see the tooltip has popped up. I'm hovering over the freeze icon, the global freeze icon. So if I right click this, now I can either freeze all, which would freeze all the tracks in the session, or I can uncheck certain boxes. So right now, if I froze all, I would freeze all audio tracks or any other combination of those. So I can option click that button as well. If I have all those options checked off, I can option click this button or this the button icon. I can option click this icon and it will global freeze all the tracks in the session. Now, if I select a couple tracks, more than one track, and I hold option shift, option shift, and I click this icon, then I would only freeze the tracks that I've selected. So option is like a do to all. This is the common way that it's described for Pro Tools. Option is due to all, and option shift is due to selected. You know, perform to all or manipulate all, manipulate selected, however you want to think of it. But now we'll see here. See, those two tracks are frozen, but the audio track is um, not affected. So let's go ahead and option click again. There we are, we're back to regular state. I'm just doing it one more time. I wanted to see if the approximate time was the same. So after that completes, uh, so here's global freeze. There's the global freeze icon. There's your options to choose what you're gonna global freeze. And then this is what I was talking about with option click the global freeze icon to globally, globally freeze all tracks. Um, right click and choose freeze all. And then we're going to go into bounce. Okay, fine. Okay, so track bounce here is very convenient. Uh, I'm I'm rendering this one more time, so it looks like it looks like the times are about the same. For some reason, I wanted to see if it was approximately the same each time. Okay, I'm gonna clarify something real quick here as well. So this is our global freeze icon here. If I right click this, this is I can freeze all. All right. Now, if I select two tracks here. 
and I try to option shift and click this icon. So if I hold option shift and click this icon, we're gonna go through this render process. Now watch, I selected two tracks and I chose option shift and I clicked the global freeze icon. Thinking I'm only going to render these two tracks here, this instrument one, instrument two. Watch the audio track though. So remember the audio track's not selected. Okay, so the audio track though is frozen. So that icon, that blue icon at the top of the screen, that is global. That is for all tracks. Now undo or not undo, we'll just we'll just do a um, an option click. So we're going to here. No, let's click the global freeze icon again. So let's right click. I'm going to right click and unfreeze all. Okay, so we're back. You see the icon is not blue anymore. Now I've got the two tracks still selected. So the audio track's not selected, this, just these two tracks. Now I'm gonna hold Option Shift and click the freeze icon on one of these tracks. All right, so you see, those two tracks, the option shift by, I selected two tracks. You could do two or more, but I selected two tracks, option shift, click the icon here, and it froze the selected tracks. This up here is global freeze. So this affects all the tracks in the session. Now, one more time, I'm gonna do something else. I'm gonna hold option shift again, so that I can unfreeze all the tracks in the session. Now I'm going to click this button, I'm gonna option, hold option and click that freeze icon. So I hope you see the difference here. So if I option click one of the freeze icons in a track header, that is freeze all tracks. If I select two or more tracks and I option shift click. So the first time I said, if I option click a freeze icon, it's global freeze all tracks in the session. This one here, I'm selecting two or more tracks and I'm holding option shift and clicking a, froze, a freeze icon, okay? So I can pick between all the tracks or selected tracks. When I get up to the global freeze icon, this is affecting all tracks in the session. This is the global freeze icon. So if you wanna freeze selected tracks, you would select multiple tracks and then option shift, click one of the icons in the track header. So that's what I wanted to clarify. Track bounce. Track bounce is nice because if I have stems in the session or if I have tracks in the session that I want to bounce out and I have routings, if I have various routings, I don't have to change those routings to bounce the track. So right now, if I have all these tracks in my session and I want to bounce all the tracks out, I select all the tracks and I do track bounce and I get the track bounce dialog. So if I have automation, I can include that in there. I want wave, I'm gonna do the same. Now look, I'm using 192 kilohertz sample rate, <clears throat> which is part of the reason why I was using so much CPU in this session, because I was running at 192. But for demonstration purposes, I'm just gonna keep going. I'm using the same sample rate that I've used for my session. I could change this if I want to, I could change this to 2444.1 and 2448. But if this was going to be tracks bounced out to send to somebody else for mixing and you've recorded the session at 192, you should probably give them the stems at 192 unless they specifically ask you, hey, send me the stems at you know 24-bit 96K or whatever. Do I want to import them after the bounce? No, I'm not going to import them. I'm going to stick them into the bounced files folder. And now this file name prefix, you don't need a file name prefix. For example, if you've gone through, now my session, my naming conventions in this um, session uh, don't, don't follow what I'm 
doing in this session. I mean, I think I've talked a lot about trying to be careful about naming your tracks. So, you know, if we go through here, drums, synth, I'm holding command and hitting return to jump to the next track. So, and we'll call this Vox 1. Box two, box two. I'm going to copy that command A, command C, and then paste, paste. All right, box sub, so I'm gonna hold command, hit return, and then box sub commit, I'll keep that one. I'm gonna delete this track. Okay, so just so that we have a real naming convention, that's why I wanted to take the extra seconds to do that. So select all the tracks, <coughs> and then pick track bounce. Everything we talked about here, not gonna import after bounce. So file name prefix. You don't need a file name prefix. Think about it. If I'm sending the tracks, if I'm bouncing all the tracks out of the session, I don't need to put a prefix. I already have the names there. So if I put the name of the song, you know, whatever, Easy Drummer Demo, if that's the name of the song, Easy Drummer Demo, and I put Easy Drummer Demo in here, every single track that leaves the session that goes into the Bounced Files folder, every single track is going to have Easy Drummer Demo and then the track name which is just gonna be a mess. So you don't need a file name prefix, just leave it blank if you're bouncing out the tracks to send as stems. So I'm gonna show you this, Ch click choose. So the default path is this bounced files folder, which is fine. But remember that if you bounce tracks into this bounced files folder and you go back at a later time and do a save copy in of the current session that's open, the bounced files folder does not carry over into the save copy in. So I'm going to click open here. So now I am going to send these tracks into that folder. Click bounce. <clears throat> right click at the icon, drop into the folder. There's all my tracks. All the tracks in the session bounced out together. Now I'm going to show you this real quick just so you can be mindful of this. So let's say I go over here and I do a save copy in. Check my audio files box. Click OK. Uh, so this is 1902 Lecture 8. No. There it is. It's like it was hiding from me. So this is, this is the original session folder. This is the session folder of the session that's open right now, okay? So I'm gonna leave this as copy of, no. Okay, I'll call it archive. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. That's just great. Let's see if it even saved. Okay, yeah, so it didn't complete it. It didn't complete the, the, the bounce. Let's reopen Pro Tools. It may have been, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why it did that. I haven't had Pro Tools crash Pardon me, I haven't had Pro Tools crash do, doing a save copy in, but I don't think ever uh, that I can think of. If I if it had if it happened, it was maybe once or twice because I've forgotten about it. So at any rate, click cancel. Let's open the recent session and see if everything's in there. If not, we'll go dig in session file backups and pull it open. Okay, so that doesn't look like our last session. So. What I like to do is just go here. Once I have the session open and realize it's not what I want, I right click, drop into my session, go into my session file backups, click here. 
I'm looking at the dates. That's the most recent one right there. Double click it. Don't save. That's the open session that I'm not saving. Okay. And so there I am. So I'm back to a session that's somewhat cooperating. So what I'll do, since I had the crash, I'll do save as. Now remember, this is not the archive. This is the original session that I was trying to archive out of. So I'll call this. Version two. Save. And let's do a save copy in again and see if it survives. Include the audio files. I'm just going to go archive to make it simple. Save. Ah, so it, maybe it's something with the 192 sample rate. Um, here, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to copy this bounced files folder. I'm determined to do this. I'm going to put it into this session folder here. Okay. I'm going to open this session. Pro Tools is booting. We're, we're off on a little bit of a, it's not really a tangent. We kind of just got off at the exit and we were taking like a little, you know, historic route along the highway here for a second. And your default path for bouncing the tracks out is the bounced files folder. <clears throat> when you create those files in that bounced files folder, if you do a safe copy in, the bounced files folder does not carry over. So I, I, I hope that's clear by now. If it's not, let me know and I can, I can reiterate it. So track bounce, similar to bounce to disc, which we're gonna get to. So bounce to disc is the whole session. I have a session, it's complete. I can play it front to back. It sounds like a song. I bounce to disc, I turn that multi-track session into a stereo mix. Track bounce is each individual track bounced out to a separate audio file, put into another DAW to send off for mixing, stems, whatever. The great thing is, is that <clears throat> if you have multiple tracks routed, like right here with these tracks that were routed into this sub, box sub is frozen. Let's see here. Hmm, okay, so let's do this. Let's go like that. So I option clicked that freeze icon, and now I'm back to real time, everything real time in the session. So even though <clears throat> all these tracks are routed, if you notice here, the output says Vox Sub, and the input here, says Vox Sub. So even though all these tracks are routed into this Vox Sub, because I selected all the tracks in the session to do track bounce, every individual track is bounced out separately. So it's really convenient. Just a little reminder here. So if you're going to use Track Bounce, you're, that track's gonna leave the session, right? Commit we're gonna keep using the tracks in the session. When we commit tracks, turns it into an audio file, puts the audio file in the audio files folder for the session, and then we have the audio track in the session. So <clears throat> track bounce, typically you're, you're, the track is leaving the session for, for use in another purpose. So we can track bounce on audio tracks, aux tracks, instrument tracks, and on the master fader. Track bounce is under the menu here, track menu bounce. Right click on the track and bounce the track or command option shift B, command option shift B. And then that dialog that we saw pop up, remember I don't see the need to do a file name prefix. If you've got all your tracks named in your session, 
don't put a prefix in there. When they get thrown into the bounced files folder, they will be named as your tracks were named. All right, so bounce to disk. Bounce to disk is where we're taking, you know, it might be parts of a song, but more than likely bounce to disk is going to be we're going to bounce the entire song. So, for example, with this, if this was my song, I would want to choose a selection length. Now, Pro Tools, if I just hit return and I choose bounce to disk up here in the file menu, Pro Tools will let me bounce the song. But what's going to happen is when I get to the end of the song, Pro Tools is going to bounce till the end of the last clip in the session. So if I have reverb tails or delay tails that carry out past the last clip in the session, I don't want my song to sound as if, the, if it's been cut off. So what I like to do, if I'm choosing where the end of my song is going to be, I like to put insertion file as playback on and listen from some point at the end of the song. Ooh, that's awesome. That's tone. So I'll listen to the end of the song. And I'll listen, okay, no more reverbs, no more delays. And I get an idea of how I think that song would end. How do, how do I think it would sound as that song faded out and then a new song on the album picked up? So what I do is, again, I listen to it one more time, thinking about the delay tails and the reverbs slowly decaying, and then a little bit of a gap at the end for pause until the next song starts. And listen. Remember, insertion file is playback is enabled, so wherever I hit the space bar, that's where my insertion is going to land. And so one more time. I'm listening. Okay. Song is done. One, two, stop. So my insertion stopped where my playback stopped because look up at the top left here. Insertion file playback was enabled. Now I can hit shift return. Now I've got my bounce length. Then I can come in here and I can choose bounce to disc. I get a bounce to disc dialog. And then I'm bouncing my stereo outs using wave interleave 24 bit 192 if that's what I choose. That's a conversation to be had. I mean, if it's a final output product, then you're probably going to need to go down to, you know, I, I, if it's for streaming, you have to find out what the platform or what your aggregator is going to accept. Some may be accepting 2448. Some may require 2444.1. I believe iTunes um, has multiple formats that they'll allow uh, mixes or songs to be submitted. So you just have to check your aggregator, <clears throat> you know, like a tune core, a CD baby, or the other ones. There's a couple other ones out there. Anyways, the bounce, the end result of the bounce uh, is going to affect how you're going to set your bit depth and sample rate. For now, I'll do a CD kind of thing. I'll do 16441 Redbook CD standards. <clears throat> and then the file name. Now, of course, I'm going to have to use this file name, different than in the track bounce where I let the track names define the names that appear. This is the name of the song. <clears throat> so let's call this. 1902 final countdown. If I could spell remix. So some type of name in there for your song. And the, now, the, again, the default path is the bounced files folder, which is super convenient. But you have to remember some of the idiosyncrasies of the safe copy in process, not carrying the bounce files folder over. Now, I'm going to go into that folder, though, because I've got stems in there already. And now I'm going to start to put some mixes in there. So what I can do is, in that bounced files folder... is I could create another folder. Final mixes. Right? And then I could put my final mixes in their final mix folder. So I can make subfolders inside that folder to keep things organized. 
I don't have to jam everything into the folder. And everything's internal in my session. I don't have any external instruments or external effects connected. Everything is inside the DAW, so I can use this offline process. And then I click Bounce, and then the file bounces out. I'll click Cancel so we don't have to wait for it. File bounces out and lands in that folder that we created inside the Bounce Files folder. So as I was saying, it renders the entire mix or a partial mix to disk. So for example, I may decide I want everything, uh, I want just the vocals, right? So I could mute my drums and my synths, and then I could do a bounce to disk and bounce everything out except the synths and the drums. Or maybe I'd want to do this. Maybe I just want the drums and the synths and I don't want the vocals. But I would say most likely a lot of the times you would be bouncing your entire mix. <clears throat> so it's important to catch this last bullet point. What you hear at the output is what you get. You have to make sure you don't have any tracks that are muted. If a track is soloed and you're just hearing that one track, when you do the bounce, you're going to hear just that track. Watch your click track. If you have a click track in your session and you're going to bounce to disc, make sure your click track is muted. Now, what I've talked about a lot in, in class is how when I create a click track, what I like to do is put it at the top of the session and I like to right click it and hide it. Because again, my metronome over on the top right of the screen, my metronome's in my MIDI controls. So I don't need to see the click, I just need to engage and disengage or enable and disable it. Well, if you're gonna do a bounce to disc, make sure that you turn the metronome off or if you still have your click track visible, what I like to do at a certain point is just make that inactive. If the click is still in the session, I'll just make it inactive or hide it and make it inactive. That way I don't have to worry about, because if I have a mute here and I hold option and I click on that mute, it, it mutes globally all the tracks in the session. So if the click is active and it's muted and I come in here and I'm not thinking because the click may be hidden, and I option click mutes, oh wait, no, I don't want that, and I option click again to unmute, then my click is gonna be unmuted. So you have to kind of decide how you're gonna manage that. If you're going to let that click be hidden and active, then all you have to do is just look over here in the top right and just turn off the metronome before you do the bounce. A um, little hint about your week four project. A lot of students lose points because I can hear the click in the bounce. You should hear no click in the bounce. All right, so real-time bouncing. When I did that last bounce demonstration, in the lower left corner of the window, I was able to use this offline option, okay? Now, this is talking about real-time bouncing. So if I uncheck this offline bounce, that means that I'm real-time bouncing. That means that instead of seeing a progress bar, a rendering bar appear, I would actually have to listen. I'd see a timer appear. Wow. wow. That had to be really fun. That had to be really fun. It startled me, so if it startled you, <clears throat> I feel for you. At any rate, you see what happens. Um, the reason why that tone is in there, what, what happened is, is that when I've created and consolidated these clips, I did the consolidation that includes tone, which tone can be a good way to set meters and set levels and calibrate a system. So um, control option shift three. So option shift three creates a blank clip but control option shift three puts tone in the session. So that's why we heard, heard that loud 1K tone uh, because those, those consolidated clips that are representing vocals are actually test tones. So hopefully it startled you less than it startled me because I actually did a little bit of a, of a jump, you know? It was like a J-O-L, it was like a jump out loud. So real-time bouncing, when I do this bounce procedure, and I don't have the offline checked, when I click bounce, I'll be listening to the song from start to end. And if I've made my edit selection to represent the length of that bounce, Pro Tools will still follow the length of that bounce, but I'll listen to that session in real time. I will not listen to the session. I mean, I won't have a progress bar 
where it'll just render it out and I won't hear it. Now that's important to know about real-time bouncing because look at the last two bullet points. If I'm using any, any type of external effects processors that are coming from say a rack and then into my interface, I can't use the offline bounce. I have to use real-time bounce. Also, if I have external synths connected that are coming into my interface or into a mixer and then through an interface, um, any external effects, any external synths, you cannot use offline bounce. You have to use the real-time bounce. Offline bounce is a lot more convenient uh, because it happens so much faster, but the limitations are that if I have external effects or external synths, I can't use the offline bounce. But most of the time, the offline bounce is excellent. It's, it's very, very convenient. Now, I will say that the nice thing about an online bounce or unchecking the offline box over on the right there is you actually get to hear what you're producing, what is coming through as you're doing the bounce. Because if you're doing an online bounce, you're listening to the bounce as it's happening. So you can kind of be sure that everything's in the bounce the way that you want it. If you check the offline box and you do everything offline, you have no way to know if something was muted in the session or was the click in there. So you have to go back and listen to it. But, <clears throat> you know, quality control is, is so important. And I think a lot of people think this way, but it's worth just talking about it real quick here. Whether you do an offline bounce or whether you do an online bounce, I think you're probably going to take that mix and go listen to it on a couple more systems. I mean, even if, you, if you've done a reference mix and you've come back in and you said, okay, I'm going to print my final bounce, I would think that you would go ahead and listen to that final bounce at least one or two more times um, just to really, really be sure that everything is the way that you want it. So I'm just kind of giving a cautionary note here that offline bouncing is really convenient, but you have to make sure that when you're done with the project and you think the mixes are done, you take them and you listen to them front to back in the car or at home or on your two-channel listening system if you do two-channel or some way to do a dedicated, focused, final QC on every single mix that you do. Because I've just seen it so many times where somebody uses a convenient feature and doesn't think about, hmm, should I check this, this, and this? And then they deliver the product and then something's wrong with it. You know, people are forgiving. Hey, you know, I understand. It's fine. Just get me the new mixes and stuff. But you don't want to have that happen too many times because then people start to question your judgment. So just be careful. That's all I'm saying is just be careful. Offline bouncing is really, really convenient, but it's it, it, you have to be even more careful with your quality control because you're not hearing the bounces that's happening. Pro Tools is just ripping off a file. It's convenient, but just be really careful. So why, were we, why are we bouncing? Well, we're bouncing to be able to listen to our song that's in the DAW on some other type of playback system. We have to turn it into a stereo interleave file so that we can listen to it in iTunes. We have to turn it into a stereo interleave file so that we can make a CD out of it. We have to turn it into a stereo interleave file so we can take our songs and send them to an aggregator to put them up into Tidal and Spotify and, and you know, every other, uh, a a Apple Music, all the different streaming platforms. So this is why we're bouncing, to create the files that we need to submit so we, people can actually listen to these songs as music. <clears throat> So when you're done with your mixes, and I'll talk about this more in the mixing lecture, but, you know, mixing and mastering should be, and most of the time are, two different scenarios. So you're not really trying to think about taking your final, your mix as you're working on it and make that your final, final, final mix. People do it and things come out sounding great, but I think that there's a separation and thought process that's really nice to just do a great sounding mix and then think about mastering later. And if you have someone else that has a penchant towards mastering, if they like mastering more than mixing and it's, you know, one of your classmates, then you may 
give your stuff to that person for them to master. And they may not like mixing very much, so they may give you their stuff to mix and you guys can kind of trade off. Or if you have the budget and you're actually going to use a mastering engineer, which there's a guy in Orlando named Bob Katz that's a phenomenal mastering engineer, you would have a conversation with him. You would say, hey, Mr. Katz, I'm going to, you, you know, I'd like to utilize your services. I'd like to send you my mixes. What do you need? You know, like a pre-production conversation you would have with him. So you're going to find out what, hey, you know, I did my mixes in 24-bit 192. Can I send you those mixes? Oh, I've done my mixes in 24-bit 96K. Can I send you that? Yeah, send me the full res files or, you know, do this. And he might give you some specific process or he might just say, hey, you know what? Just bring your hard drive. I have Pro Tools here. Let's load it up and we'll see what we need to do. But, you know, those pre-production conversations save a lot of time and clarify a lot of things. So even if you're just working with someone else that's a friend that's also a classmate, you know, make time to have like that pre-production conversation and talk about these different things. Hey, how did you make the mix? How did you set your session parameters? What's the bit depth? What's your sample rate? Those kind of things. Um, and there's a slew of books out there on mastering. Um, one one um, great book by Bob Katz is called Mastering Audio. I'm pretty sure that's the name of it. Um, but it's a really, really great book on mastering. And some of the topics can be a little bit... I was going to say dry... But they're not dry. That's just my opinion of how I was feeling sometimes when I was reading the book. I think sometimes very, very technical information sometimes our brain wants to trick us into thinking that we're tired or we're not interested or this is stupid or whatever it is. Um, but at any rate, without getting off track and talking about all the little mental games we play with ourselves, if you want to find out about more about the mastering process, I would look at Bobcat's book. If you were going to send your materials to a mastering engineer have the pre-production conversation and check hey where should my levels be on my mixes where should my peaks be you know and they'll say something like you know leave me a couple db a headroom i say you know mixes at say minus four minus six something like that rms values they can go into you uh, you know in, more, into more detail with that uh, over that with you excuse me they can go into more detail about that with you um, and you're always going to do pulse code modulation, PCM pulse code modulation. You're going to do full res files. So if you've done this session, like I said, 24-bit 48K, that's the output file that you're going to create. You're not going to send MP3s off uh, for mastering. I think the only time you would really need to do an MP3 is if you're doing, um, you know, like some type of, of like a, you know, a beat site or if you make instrumental music or library music and you're putting samples up on your website or if they buy you know the $50 non-exclusive you know you could put the mp3 up there and give them the mp3 for the low price and then for different levels of pricing they can get better quality for another 50 bucks they can get the full res wave file for 300 bucks they can get the track outs whatever it is so just think about that stuff and then this last piece interleaved or split stereo most of the time you're going to create splits, I'm, I'm sorry, interleave files. You're going to create stereo interleave files for playback on other, um, you know, like consumer types of systems or stereo playback systems. Split sp stereo is going to be a very specific option uh, that we'd use for other workflows. But again, that um, would be a conversation that would come up and you would know what you were producing. So... Again, something we'll talk about more when we get into the mixing levels or the mixing lecture. Um, for the master fader in the session, we're not going to automate the master fader, and we'll talk about that more. Um, most of the time, you can save any type of fades or transitions from one song to another for the mastering engineer to take care of. So for bounce to disc, mainly we're using bounce to disc to create a final mix, to print a final mix. But we can also create loops. We can print our effects. And we can also write submixes by using the bounce to disk option. So let's talk about printing and bouncing real quick here. Now, commit gives us the freedom to freely take a track that's got a performance on it and it's got some plugins loaded on it. And all we have to do 
in the new versions of Pro Tools is, as we talked about in the beginning of this lecture, hit commit and the whole audio file shows up in our session and we're good to go. But if you're on an older system, um, you don't have that option, so you have to print. So one of the reasons or some of the reasons we're thinking about printing is because there's all kinds of different scenarios, but one would be, let's say that you have a demo for a plugin and you get a 30 day fully functional demo and you start to write music with that plugin. Well, that demo is going to run out and you're not going to have access to it. So hopefully you'll buy it if you like it. But if you just get, you know, one or two things out of it and you're like, you know, I like what I created here, but I'm not going to use the demo. I'm not going to purchase the full version. Well, then you could commit that track in your session to an audio file and then have that saved. But if you don't have commit, then you have to do it a different way. So let's do this. Let's select all these. Let's mute them. Actually, I'm going to make them inactive so we don't have to hear that crazy sound again. All right, so I got this synth part here. The drums are a little low. Don't worry about that. I'm just giving you this whole synth thing. Now we know if I right click here, I can commit this. And I have a send on there, so I'll do that. Do nothing because I want that track to stay there. Let it render for a second. Okay, there's my synth, committed. Beautiful, right? Well, if I don't have the ability to commit in my session, then I need to print, which is really straightforward. All I need to do is create an audio track. So I create a stereo audio track. Now let's try something here. So I tried to use the same name. There's a track playlist with this name. Please choose a new name. So I can't use the same name. So what I like to do is I like to use the exact same name, but I put it in all caps. So now I can have my audio track have the name synth. So I know when I see all caps, just in my workflow, in my brain, if I name something in the session and it's all caps, or if I see a name in a session and it's all caps in my session, I know that that's audio. I know for a fact it's audio. So just something to think about in terms of being able to kind of keep these, these visual references or these name references fresh in your mind. So what I need to do is I need to assign the track output, okay? And I need to assign that to a bus. So a bus is just an available signal path. That's it. Bus is a signal path. It's an internal pathway, an internal audio pathway. So I could pick any of these buses. I tend to use, I tend to leave the top 12 buses for when I'm routing sends to do time-based effects. So I'll st start with bus 13, 14. And we're going to get into time-based effects in the, um, in the mixing lecture. So there, bus 13, 14. Now I can right away rename that, and I could use that same name, synth. So now I can see that, that the bus is named synth. And then I go to the input of this track, and I just pick bus, and then there it is, synth. All right, so if I record enable this track right now and hit return, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute the drums so I don't hear anything. Now think back to the recording lecture. Look up in the top right of the screen here. You'll see my mouse moving near the MIDI controls. You see the red LED that tells me that I have a track record enabled in the session. The LED below it is my input status. Remember that the default monitor mode for Pro Tools is auto input monitoring. So since I have the synth track record enabled and I'm hitting play, Pro Tools thinks that there's a clip on the track that I want to hear. But I don't. So what I need to do is I need to click the input monitor because I want to monitor the input, that synth input. So now when I hit play, I'm going to hear the synth play through. So my output's a little bit hot here, so I'm going to 
take this and bring it down a little bit and listen to it one more time. So I can see the levels moving in the meters here, right here. But on this output plate here, if I right click, you see how it says output window button? I'm not clicking yet. If I hover over this and I click on that output window button, then I get a full size fader with the meter and everything. Now I can look at my levels and I feel like I can gauge more accurately where my levels are. So I'm going to I'm going to actually pull that down again a little bit more. I'm going to hold command and I'm going to pull the volume of the synth output down. So I'm going to click on that and then I'm going to hold command and then I'm going to pull this down. gives me stepped increments that I can adjust in, tenth of a dB increments. Okay, so that, that's a little bit better. I like that headroom better. So I'm going to hit return, and now all I need to do is just record. So I have mine set up for command spacebar, so I'm going to command spacebar. Okay, so I deliberately left the, I, I just did normal record mode. Even though if you look up at the transport, I'm in quick punch. I just did kind of a normal record mode. I started recording at one place and then I stopped at another place because I want to get these synth tails in there. So let me take the input monitor off and I can take the record enable off too. Okay, so I want those synth tails in there so that as I build the arrangement, if I want to keep that clip, the, the length of the MIDI clip, if I want to keep the audio clip the length of the MIDI clip, that's fine. So I can just make the selection. Remember, my link track and edit selection is enabled, so I can click on the next track nameplate below, and then I can move that edit selection down. So now I can trim to selection. So there it is. That's an exact replica of what's happening up in the MIDI track. So I could mute the MIDI track. I could hide it, make it inactive, whatever I wanted to do. So then if, I wanna, if I'm working in the session and I want to duplicate this out a couple times, so that would be 16 bars. So as we played into the chorus, if this was the, where the chorus starts, I probably want those reverb tails or delay tails to carry out. So now I can go up here and grab my standard trim tool. Oops, that's the clip gain line. Remember I said about having that clip gain line floating in the way, and it, it's better to have the clip gain info here to adjust. So I'm going to go view, clip, and then take the clip gain line away. So now I can just pull that out. Look, so I've got the loop section, and I can keep looping that and duplicating that. Or when I get to a spot where I want to let that synth decay out, I've got those delay tails in there. So just something to consider as you're, as you're printing. But again, this is, don't lose the perfect sound, especially if you're using external synths and external MIDI. You can print that stuff as quick as possible because sometimes the next day when you come back, for some reason, sometimes things just don't sound the same way. And sometimes you just can't explain it. Um, not often. I mean, if you using your gear the right way, you should be able to just set it up exactly the way you had it before. But you'll just save yourself some troubleshooting if you can just get things printed down as audio really quick. Also, once we print things as audio, you don't have to worry about, oh, you know, I was using such and such plug-in and such and such DAW, or that's right, I was on so-and-so's Pro Tool system, and they're using an older HD uh, uh, hardware setup, so we were using Pro Tools 8, and it, you know, there's just so many dynamics that can happen. But as soon as you print something, and in our case, in the newer versions, commit, it's there. It's all embedded in the WAV file. You can play that WAV file in any computer program. So that's the real benefit of getting stuff printed as audio as quickly as possible. This is what I just did. I took the instrument track, 
created a new audio track, routed the output of the instrument track to the input of the audio track, and recorded it. I could do that with multiple tracks. If I had 10 instrument tracks, <clears throat> excuse me, I could create 10 audio tracks. I could route all those instrument tracks into the audio tracks, and I could record all of them at the exact same time. So just like I did with the one track, I could do with multiple tracks. And just some uh, reminder and refreshers on the clip list menu, managing your clips. You know, if we're thinking about we're getting towards the end of the session or towards a time when uh, we, we might be passing the session off or something, we may want to come in here and select unused clip to accept whole files. And if we have anything in here that needs to be cleared out, let's see what I'm seeing as far as my, yeah, so I'm seeing all my clips. So I don't have anything to clear out here, but I could say select unused, accept whole files. And if I had anything here that was unused, I could go ahead and just clear those, the clear option. Um, let me select a couple of these just to get the clear option to appear. And then I could pick. Um, remove, as a reminder, is it takes it out of the clips list, but it leaves it in the session folder. So any of these subset clips would just get cleared, okay? But since I have whole files selected, it's asking me what I want to do with the whole files. Remember, the whole files are the bold ones. So if I remove, it pulls the clip references out of the session, but the audio files are still in the audio files folder for the session. If I choose move to trash, it takes all the whole files, puts them in the trash. If I choose delete, they evaporate. Um, you just have to be careful. You have to be careful that you know what you're removing out of the session. You don't have to do this, you know, in a global fashion. You could pick and choose. You could say, hmm, you know what? I, all, oh, all these tracks are inactive. I don't need those Vox tracks. So I could select all these Vox tracks. There we go. And I could clear those. And I'll, I'll remove them. Let's just remove them. And so, so I don't have to get hit with this prompt every single time because there's multiple clips that are getting cleared. I'll hold Option and click Yes. So all those whole files are out of the session, and you can see here that they're not even in the respective tracks at all. If I right-click and I go into the folder here, and I go into my audio files folder, you can see they're still in the audio files folder because I, choosed, I, choosed, I chose remove. I tried to say chose and remove at the same time. I chose remove, and it removed them as clip from and move them from the session as clip references, but it left them in the audio files folder. <clears throat> if you're doing session management, you're trying to reduce the size of your session, removing the clip references from the session um, kind of defeats the purpose of trying to manage the size of the session. But if you're just trying to quickly get things out of the way, that can be a nice way to do it because you're not going to have to worry about accidentally deleting something. Again, I will say, this kind of session management and clearing clips, clearing whole files, all this stuff, we're dealing, we're working in a world where hard drive space is very inexpensive, and we've talked about that several times. But just be very careful when you're doing this kind of clips list management because if we go up to our undo history, remember clearing clips clears the undo history. Okay, so these are the options that we went through. Select unused, selects all the clips and whole files not in the playlist, select unused except whole files, selects the clips not used in the playlist, exclude, excluding the whole files. So in other words, if you choose select unused, it's gonna choose all unused clips in the session, including whole files. If you choose unused except whole files, it's going to choose what it says. All the unused clips in the session, but it's going to leave the whole files alone. So you just have to be very careful about those whole files because that's your audio. If you have offline clips in the session that aren't being used, then you can choose select offline clips and clear those out of there. This is our options that we went through. Remove, move to trash, delete. Continuation of that. Uh, see if there's anything pertinent to point out here. 
well, we just did this. Pro Tools can remove clips from the session playlist and the clips list, but will not delete the parent audio file. Um, that's if we choose remove, okay? And then this last point about whole files. Select unused audio except whole files is still required to protect imported files that haven't been placed in a playlist. Um, you know, your alternate, alternate takes, things like that. So in other words, if I've dragged clips into the clips list and I haven't used those out in the arrangement area here in the tracks, if I choose select unused, it's going to select those whole files that I haven't used yet, and I could wind up clearing whole files that were in my clips list that I needed. So that's why I keep saying you have to be careful about when you're going to try to do this kind of clips list management stuff. All right, a couple more slides here. Compacting. So if you, if you, make a, if you have a performance, so let's do this. Let's make this track active. All right, and let's go this way. And like this. So let's just say we did a vocal recording pass right here. We recorded the first verse of a song. And we realized, you know what? Actually, I'm only going to, I, I like this here. So I trim the selection. And I only use this much of the clip. Well, I still have all of that other audio that existed outside of this edit range that's sitting on the hard drive not being used. One way that you can conserve space is you could take this clip and you could compact it. And what it's doing is it's keeping this selection range that you see here, that is going to remain on the drive as audio, including an extra one second, and I could change this to two seconds, but an extra one second on each side of the clip. So if you think of it like this, I mean, I'm just gonna make a little visual example here. I'm not gonna try to be perfect with it, but if you just imagine I'm extending the edit selection a little bit. So you get an extra one second on each side of the file. So if I compact that, Pro Tools takes any of the audio outside of the range that's demonstrated there and just completely deletes it off the hard drive. So it compacts the clip down, it truncates the clip down so that you're saving space and you don't have a bunch of stuff on the hard drive that's just sitting there as unused audio. This is another one that you just have to be very careful about. Be very careful that you know you don't need any of the extraneous audio on either side of the clip and that it's not something where you're going to go through and compact the whole session and then somebody's going to come back and want to do more vocal edits, but you've compacted clips so you don't have any of the extra audio in there. So it is a way to clean things up, especially if you're doing like sound effects, you know. You go out, you go out in the field, you take your, you know, your iPhone recorder or you take a, a sound devices mixer and a boom or you take a portable handheld digital recorder you go out and you're capturing sound you know you're capture, capturing door slams or go to a construction site and capture some of the, the sounds you know just for raw sounds to start creating other sounds well you get that file in your DAW and you stood there for three minutes waiting for this bird to chirp because you heard a bird making a cool sound and you're like oh that could be a dinosaur so you stand up, you're like, you hear the sound, you pull the recorder out and you're holding the recorder, you're standing there for three minutes and all of a sudden three minutes in, he goes, wah. So you got three minutes of audio for him to go, wah. By the way, don't get scared. That's me making the sound. That's not really a velociraptor. So now I say, okay, well, here's the audio that I want. So I trim that. Well, I've got all that other audio that's just sitting on the drive, three minutes of audio that I know I'm not using. Well, now, because I know what I'm doing and I'm in my workflow the way that I would handle editing the audio, I can go ahead and leave the extra one or two seconds of audio on the, on the sides of the clip and then compact it. And then now, if I can use this wherever I want, but now I have just this as the, this is just the audio file on the drive. That audio file has been compacted so that it is not taking up as much space on the drive. So I, hopefully you'll find some use for that. Just be careful with it. 
and then export clips as files. So another example for you. If you're working in any type of video editing program, say you're going to work in um, Adobe Premiere, and you're going to have a video playing in Adobe, in Adobe Premiere, but you want to create vo a voiceover for the video. Well, to me, it's much easier to create a voiceover and edit a voiceover in Pro Tools and then take that audio and send it out or, or export it out and then drag it into Adobe Premiere. So here's a quick example, and then we'll wrap up here. So I've got my voiceover that I've recorded. And let's, let's say that I've, you know, again, I'm giving an example. I've taken some of the, you know, the, the, the room noise out. And then I had this edit here. Okay, I'm using shuffle mode. Had a couple things that I needed to shuffle down here. Right, cleaned up the end. So I've got my, my edit exactly how I want it. And then I put it in my EQ. All I did was just do like a low cut, maybe around 75. Maybe I did, you know, do a, a slight cut in the low mids. And maybe I did a little boost in the one to five K range. And then maybe I had a little compression on there. And I went with a soft knee. I did like a two to one. Right. And um, there, just uh, not, not really worried about setting the compressor. I'm giving you a visual example here. So I've got this voiceover set up. So what I would do, well, I got that all ready to go. I commit it. Okay, so there, there is my, oh, wait, hold on. Commit. Select a track, there it is, consolidate clips. So I want the clips to be consolidated. Click OK. Boom, there's my voiceover. I've got my compression, I've got my EQ. Sounds perfect. So, now I'm going to export that clip as a file. So the clip is selected. I go up here, export clips as files, whatever format I need it in. Now, where's my destination directory? Well, right now, well, here, that's what it's telling me. It's telling me that it's going to be Lecture 8 Audio Files folder. Well, what I want to do is I want to change this. Sorry, give me one second here. 1902 Lecture 8. I'm just making sure I'm using the right session because it sent me into a prior session that I used. You see? VO for Premiere. So this is the, the what I'm saying is I'm creating voiceovers in Pro Tools, getting them produced perfectly with the right editing, the right plug-in settings, nice, punchy, good quality voiceover. And then I'm going to export this voiceover and then just be able to to drag that clip over into Premiere fully produced. So I'm gonna to go to my sessions and I want 1902 lecture eight here. So it wants to send me into the audio files folder, but again, I can use my bounce files folder here and I can call this BO exports. Maybe not, BO exports. Okay, so there's the folder now. So that's where it's going is it's going to go into my VO exports folder, prompting for duplicates. If you would run into that situation, export, drop into that folder, bounce files folder, VO exports, boom. Now all I'd have to do is take that file and just drag it right into the an audio track in Adobe Premiere or any other editor, and then boom, I'd have the fully produced voiceover ready to go. Don't have to finagle maybe a little volume adjustment in the video editor, but I'm not trying to do vocal edits, VO edits in a video assembly program. I'm doing the vocal edits and vocal recordings in a program that is uh, designed for that type of work. So. Export clips as files is very, very useful. Also, 
Um, <clears throat> if you look at the bottom example here, harvesting loops and SFX from Pro Tools to individual audio files. So go back to what I said about, you know, you go and capturing the bird up in the tree. Same thing. You could get that clip sounding exactly how you want it. Right? And then you could just go ahead and take that, export that clip as a file, <coughs> and then save that into a different folder, you know? Well, whatever. Instead of final mixes, it would be like, you know, final output effects or whatever, but a way that you could quickly export um, clips out. The thing to be very careful about as a last point is remember that when I am using this VO track, this is my original VO, if I don't have any plugins on here, right, well, then it's not going to, if I, if I export this, I can't because every single, indiv I could, but every single individual clip is going to get exported out. And then if I have plugins on here, Trying to go stereo to mono. That's why I can't copy that over. I'm just going to put one plugin on here. So even though the plugin is running in real time here, if I export clips as files, so even if this was consolidated, if I export that clip, that plugin processing is not going to be on there. So that's why I have to commit and make sure that all the processing's in the committed file and then export that committed file. So if you have any questions, let me know. Hopefully you found this video addendum worthwhile and it was not too much of a disconnect from the actual live lecture and hopefully the projectors will cooperate with us for the rest of the month. So looking forward to see you guys soon. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.